This session basically is on the diaspora rights back. And uh, we have two Goans here, original Goans. One is a Canadian national, the other one is a Australian national. Yes, I'm right. Uh, and uh, all of them have different stories. We have uh, Yulri Crotlix here, and uh, she is a Canadian national. Yeah, Canadian national. She came here five years back, five years back, right? And um, stayed here for six months. And uh, today we know her as a co founder of Goa Cycling Club. She co founded it on Facebook. Through Facebook, they have 900 members. It's not that once people go from their homeland, they just forget everything, but when they, when they connect, maybe through social media, they do something uh, different than what, what we were missing all this time. Uh, she has been a writer, they have different stories to tell us. And we have uh, 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 Sunita Piris, right? Sunita Piris Tikosha. Uh, she is a writer, uh, she is from Australia. Uh, and she, she comes to Goa quite often, I believe. Uh, right? You come to Goa quite often. So we have different stories. Uh, uh, actually, there were supposed to be two more uh, delegates here. We were supposed to panelist here, Eddie Fernandez and uh, Sarma Karwal. But unfortunately, they are not going to be able to make it. So I just uh, request you to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you can hear this. It's on. Yes. So. Um, Welcome, thank you for attending our session. Um, it's a little bit different than it might look on the program, but I think it's going to be very interesting. Unfortunately, Eddie and Selma could not make it to this session. They might have been double booked. So if you're here for them, I won't be insulted if you get up and leave. Um, on the other hand, you may hear some things from these two young ladies that you didn't expect, and maybe you'll hear some familiar things as well. Um, what I thought we could do is we could start the conversation by introducing ourselves, uh, tell our stories and, and what our thoughts about the, the diaspora are, and then I have a feeling you may have some thoughts and stories and maybe questions, and if we have time, I would love to hear those as well. So, um, to tell you a bit about myself, um, as you can tell, I have a Canadian accent, and yet, I have a very Goan name. My first name is Ulrike. I'll tell you about that in a minute. My second name is Benvinda, and my last name is Rodriguez. So, I, my father, his mother and father are from this area. My grandfather is from Olali, and my grandmother is from Nashnola. But they are a part of the Goans who emigrated to Rangoon, Burma before the Second World War. And they, from what I understand, they built a very strong and happy community there until the Japanese invaded. And then they were forced to come back to India. And my family, my ancestors were lucky enough to come by sea on the ships. Um, my father was educated both in Goa and in Bombay. He moved to the UK. He moved to London to be an electronics engineer. My mother was born in Austria on the Swiss border, and she moved to the UK to be an au pair girl and to learn English. They met in the UK, they married, they bought a house. Um, they went to Germany, where I was born, and that's why I have a German first name. They moved to Austria, had my brother, they moved back to the UK, and then for some reason, they decided to move to Canada, to the Toronto area. Um, and then I myself, when I became a, an adult, I also did a bit of a move. I moved from one side of Canada to the other side, to Vancouver, Canada. Um, that's kind of my family introduction in a nutshell, and I'd be interested to hear a little bit of uh, Sanit's family story, I guess. Um, my family, uh, my father's side, are from um, the south. So they're from, his mother is from Ben Ali. My 
his father is from Kutheri and we still have the house, which is a very lucky thing that he grew up in and was born in, in Kutheri. My mum is from Albana, but she was um, one of those immigrants whose parents went to Mumbai in the early 20th century. So um, my grandfather, my mother's father, had a job in customs in Bombay and they lived in Baikala. So my mum is not so identified with her Goan roots. She didn't speak Konkani growing up. My father, on the other hand, is deeply embedded in Konkani and to this day he loves coming here. Every year he comes for three months and uh, spends time speaking his language and reveling in being in his roots. Um, I, through a strange series of ironies, like historical ironies, I suppose, we wound, well, we wound up in Australia. That was a pretty direct route for us. One of my father's eldest, my dad's eldest brother moved to Australia after working for some time in Bahrain. And my father then followed him, his youngest, as I mentioned. But his other brothers and sisters, like many goans of um, that generation, um, post uh, the takeover, they emigrated variously to, um, well, Angola had been, one, one aunt went to Angola and then she left and went to Lisbon. Another went, my uncle Fernand went to uh, Germany, he married a German. And other, other brothers and sisters of my father married Europeans and they sort of come back. But we um, were born in Sydney, my two sisters, and um, I suppose because um, I was so inculcated with um, a sense of being Goan, and um, particularly from from my father. Uh, my mum's mum came here when she was uh, 19 to study at Bombolim Medical College, and um, she learned. She spoke Konkani at home as a third language, but learned her, her, all her medical studies. It was just the time remember what year it would have been but she did her medical training in Portuguese and another twist of fate is that my father had studied Portuguese matriculated here in Portuguese and he works now as a translator of Portuguese in Australia so there are these sort of confluences of history that um, I suppose I never learnt um, either Cockney or Portuguese because they didn't speak to us directly and Language, I suppose, is something that also roots you in where you've come from. But we've had all the other things, I suppose, that go along with knowing where you come from, like coming back. And um, I've lived in other places in my life now. I had a 12-year interval where I didn't come to Goa. And I lived for a period in Italy and the States. And um, in the last couple of years, like some sort of syndrome, it's like I've um, got from my father, this thing of I sort of just need to come after <laughs> a certain time has elapsed in Sydney and I feel this need to... I suppose there's always this curiosity about who you might have been or what you are that's the, sort of these parts of yourself that are, um, you know, you want to explore and that's why you come back. I don't even, I always say I'm going to go to Kerala. I've never been to Kerala in my life. I've come to Goa every time I've come. So, yeah. I, uh, you were just talking about what you are and I started to nod my head because in Canada, one of the most common questions I get is, what are you? And it's a little bit of a rude question, but I understand the root of it. People look at me and they hear my Canadian accent and they see my partially brown skin and they're trying to figure out what country are you from? What's your ethnicity? And um, Sanit also mentioned uh, growing up in a family that spoke Portuguese and Konkani. And my experience with Konkani is that when my father and his brothers, all of who left Goa and all of who moved to Canada, the only time I would hear them speak, speak Konkani is after they'd had a few drinks and they were starting to get angry. Mm -hmm. And they were getting angry about the past, about Goa. 
and they were, I wasn't sure what they were angry about because I don't know what they left behind. And to be honest, I, don't, I didn't even know what the word diaspora meant until I came to Goa. I didn't know I was diaspora. And so I was afraid to ask about my heritage and my culture growing up in Canada because it seemed to be a painful subject. And I, I kind of am curious if that's an experience for other diaspora. But then when I talk to Samit, it's quite pleasant and all of that. Um, I'm aware that this is a literary festival and that maybe you're not just here to hear our stories, but maybe how our writing is connected to um, being from Goans but from other places. So um, something that happened is through a series of events, um, I received notice that a distant relative had passed on. His name was Angelo de Souza and he lived in Defence Colony up in, in Pogori. I never had any interest in India. I never had any interest in being Goan. I knew very little about it. And in fact, I had negative associations with it, partially because of my father's family. However, um, uncle was so persuasive. He said, come to Goa, learn about Goa, learn about your family. You can stay in my house for free. And as a Canadian, staying in Goa for free, that sounded very appealing. And because in Vancouver, I don't drive a car, I get around by bicycle, one of the first things I did when I got here is I bought an Indian roadster, a one-speed traditional style Indian bicycle. And I used the bicycle to learn about Goa in my own way, which is on two wheels. I cycled village roads, and the bicycle enables you to stop when you hear something or see something or smell something that is interesting to you. And that's what I did. I rode the bicycle all around. I know all of these um, village roads. And I wrote stories about that for a, a website, a blog. The blog is called Girl Gone Goa, Travel, Sex, Magic, and Cycling in an Indian State. Now, people thought that was pretty spicy, and I thought I was writing for foreigners. And then more and more, I started being contacted by Indians and Goans and the diaspora who said, oh, thank you for showing photos of my village. Thank you for telling me the stories about what you've seen and tasted. And this became quite popular. So in a way, without meaning to, I was adding to contemporary Goan literature in a new electronic way. And uh, I'd be interested to hear from Sanit how her diasporic uh, connections lead, lead to literature. I'm, I'm, also, I'm fascinated to hear more about this story because we were speaking earlier and it's something that I'm very interested in at the moment about um, how you can write about a place. I have a friend who's Bengali who's here. And how you can, or she's come to Goa for the first time um, and she doesn't feel any of the freight that maybe I feel with all the familial, cultural and other associations. But when she's with, she goes to Delhi to see her relatives and she's in Kolkata, she feels all of that and more. And, um, I'm interested in this thing because writing for me is a kind of meditation now. That's the, 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 if I can get into a modality of meditation while I'm writing, it feels best. I'm not trying at anything then. And a lot, and in some senses you have to both, you're, we're carrying things around with us, whatever histories we have, but how do you enter that history? And the minute you enter a space, especially one in which you've, you know, that, that there's much invested, how can you live with that lightly and write about it in a manner that is, I suppose, transparent, so for others has meaning as well. Um, and in my earlier work, I had a novel that came out um, many years ago now. It was uh, very much about the burden of history, I suppose, that a family of um, Goans were had when they went to live, migrated to Australia, and the father had such complex relationship to 
India and Goa, and he brought, brings that um, to bear on his life in Australia, and it makes for all this kind of craziness where he's kind, kind of uh, trying to advocate for Goan, Goa's uh, uh, independence from India long after he's, uh, he's living in Australia in the 70s. But um, the things I'm doing at the moment, um, I've been writing a novella, hopefully it will come out next year in Australia. It's a novella about um, a woman who's born in Luanda, or she's born in Angola, and they moved to Luanda when she's very young. And that experience of exile, and I have a number of friends now in Australia who are either from East Africa or, um, yeah, many of them were East African Goans. And this experience where, for many of them, they, they um, had this sort of double migration because they had left Goma and exiled for some of them because then, because of the political regimes and the problems that they were faced with in the 60s and 70s, those African countries becoming independent, they had to then come back somewhere. And where is that back, if there is a back? This idea of being unhomed, um, is something that really haunted me because I had had the luxury of feeling a level of um, an unproblematic relationship to home, somewhat unproblematic. Um, so this novella is kind of about, it's called Oblivion, and it's about this young woman, so in 74, when Angola became independent, she had to come back, she comes back to Goa. But she's kind of um, discombobulated by the experience of being here. And of course, at that time, Goa was not Portuguese anymore, and she's grown up speaking Portuguese, that Goa was part of India by that time. Um, so these are the ways in which my experience of being a diasporic person, I suppose, inflects my writing. Yeah. Are we on? Yes. I'm, at this moment, I'm quite aware of our two missing guests, which is Eddie and Selma, because I am the Canadian uh, diaspora, and Sanita is from the Australia. Eddie is in East Africa. Uh, I know that he, uh, his family is from Mombasa, and maybe there are some people here from that area. And then Selma is from Dubai. So I actually was quite interested to hear their stories as well. So if you see them, tap them on the shoulder and tell them to tell you a story. <laughs> and one of the questions I would have put to the entire panel is, and here's a question that maybe you can answer. Why do Goans leave? And Sanit mentioned um, the double exile, and I think that's very poignant, is my Goan relatives left here to live in Rangoon, and then they had to leave there and come back. And then my father and his brothers one by one, they left Goa, and they left their mother and their father behind. And from the letters, I, I, can, I can almost hear my grandmother's voice of how she's trying to encourage her sons and hope that they're doing better, but their sadness. And I've heard this from today's Goans and their parents is, oh yes, I sent my daughter to the UK for a better education. Oh yes, I sent my son to the US for a better education. And guess what happened? Those young people made new friends, they met, met their future husband and wife, and they decided to stay there. So as a visitor, I almost think, are Goans partially to blame for Goans leaving? Are they sending their own family members away? I realize that may be a controversial question, but it's a question that came to my mind. Um, why do Goans leave? I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I guess each person's story is, is so different. I was just reading a beautiful story, the first story of Dr. Nelson's new book about people going to Dubai and uh, economic insecurity must be uh, so explained by I'm not working. And so there are many kinds of exile, I suppose. Economic necessity is the one that I suppose move is a big 
force for Indians in general, but Goans has historically, I'm sure my father's side of the family, they, you know, had, moved, had left for economic reasons. And even at the end of the Portuguese period, um, there were, you know, there were difficulties in the, in the early part of the century up until the time they left in terms of what kind of economic future people would have. So when they, my parent dad left in 71 or two, um, yeah, it was, I suppose, for a better life. That's what people do. Um, it, in Australia at the moment, we have a big issue with um, um, hostility towards refugees. Um, and it makes me reflect on this a lot because of the t types of forces that impel people to, to leave. And of course, economic migration, one thinks of it as elective. Whereas if you're a refugee, it's, it's something something else, you, yeah. And then maybe there are some emotional <laughs> refugees. Yeah. Like my family, there may be emotional reasons. I heard my grandfather, um, I'm almost afraid to mention his name in case somebody knows him, but I heard he was quite, a tough character, quite a tough character, and maybe that's because he had a tough life. Um, something that I noticed when I came to Goa five years ago, and that was my first time, um, and I was here for six months, and I made an effort to try to talk to a lot of people, and something that I observed is there seems to be a new generation of returned Goans, and I think that's fantastic, and maybe I'm one of them. Um, well-known people like uh, Vivek Menezes, one of the organizers, and writer Margaret uh, Mascarenas. These are people who maybe they were even born in other countries, such as myself, and they had a good life in this other country, but they chose to came back, come back. And people like Vivek, he's bringing the resources and the knowledge back with him and lending a passionate voice that is strengthening and, um, yeah, strengthening what Goa is becoming now. And when I was here six months ago, um, did anybody, do you remember the No Goa program? No, nobody remembers that. Well, it was put on by the NRI Commission and it was following the No India program. The idea was to reach out to the young uh, diaspora, which is the children of Goans, and they reached out to the countries that I mentioned, and they were to be in their 20s, and they, the government flew them into Goa and gave them a tour of Goa to acquaint them with their culture, and um, basically it was a paid-for holiday by the government, but the idea was, you know, this is, this is what your, your family's country looks like. And I remember there was a very telling moment, there was a press conference at the, um, the end of their visit. And one of the newspaper reporters asked one of the young people, um, did you enjoy your time in Goa? And she said, oh yes, very much. And he said, would you, would you come back? And she said, oh yes. And he said, to stay? And she said, oh, no, no, not to stay. And there almost was a feeling of, oh, you know, in the room, like almost a sense that, gosh, we were hoping some of these people might actually want to move back and stay in Goa. <laughs> and um, I don't know, for me, I, I, I like it here and I'd love to stay. Um, I think, I feel like we've been doing a lot of talking. Um, I. I thought it might be kind of fun just to share an anecdote, maybe about your um, your diasporic experience, or, or something that stands out for you as someone who's come back or been away, etc. Well, this it's, um, this question of how long you come for and whether you'll come back is um, something that so in this syndrome of coming over the last few years, I've often thought, I'm in a job in, in Sydney, I have another job in the public sector, and I'll leave that, and I'll come and live in the house in Cookbury, and, you know, have a life here, and then I come here, and yeah, you, you 
become, I, I become confronted by certain things. And I think what I might do is, I'll, if there's time, I'll just quickly read a poem that's about, it's sort of, there's a river in Kukuri that, um, well, obviously the, the Zawari is passing. And we've got a path, it's the Mushiwara, we call it, on the way to that river. And I walk that river since I was a little girl with my family, and I, I walk it every day when I'm here. And the, that story of the river tells me a lot about my feelings about whether I could come back and live here. So I might read if that's OK. And I hope the mic is OK. It's OK? OK. Going to the river. November, the light is different, and at the turn off to the temple, you see smoke issuing from the hills. In the fields, two women, red and green dotis, bend to pick the old dry grasses for cattle feed. The new paddy is yet to be sown, and when you ask at the El Senior supermarket for the red rice, the owner shrugs and says, look in Narragam. Quixotic, like teaching the household Estelle to compost, though her people knew this land long before anyone, and the neighbours say she is an expert gardener. Part of the path has been tarred over, and you dodge buffalo paths in a dance that reminds you of childhood, before the motor of a scooter startles you. And, startled by you, the rustle and white wings of a crane or other water bird alighting from one of the coconut palms. Tonight, the only kind of bird you see. At the pier, two girls talking into mobile phones, then quietly confiding in each other. The eye sees everything. It sees too much, reluctantly disappearing into detritus, husks, plastic bags, an old shoe, two trawlers at the river's edge going nowhere. The black sand you will see carried onto land in coming days disturbs more than the view towards Sharona. The usurper, whose little heart's dance club still obscures